27 centuries ago in the city of Nineveh, King Ashurbanipal built a library. There were other libraries before this, and there were others after. Yet for a time, the library of Ashurbanipal was the largest in the world. Within its walls were stored 30,000 clay tablets, recording the laws, the history, and the stories of the Assyrian Empire. But as is oft the fate of libraries, it eventually burned. In 612 BC, two decades after the king had died and his empire had fallen into chaos, Nineveh fell to the combined armies of Babylonia, Medes, and Scythia. They looted and burned the city, destroying its palaces, its temples, and its libraries. Nineveh itself never reclaimed its former glory. For a while it had been the biggest city on the planet, capital of the most powerful empire in history. But after the Battle of 612 BC, it fell into a long decline. The writer Xenophon, visiting two centuries later, described a city already in ruins, with even its name lost to the sands of time. Nevertheless, the idea of Nineveh persisted. The city appeared in the Old Testament as a wicked and decadent place punished by God, and centuries later was the site of a climactic battle between the Byzantines and the Sasanians. So it was then that rumors of the lost city sometimes spread and drew interest. Then, in the 19th century, European archaeologists started to dig at the site. They found the temples and palaces of the Assyrian Empire, and they unearthed the ancient library of Ashurbanipal, revealing thousands of clay tablets, each baked hard by fire two and a half millennia earlier. Among the tablets were records of battles, treaties, and the biographies of kings. The Epic of Gilgamesh was found, as were the astrological records of Babylon. Later excavations revealed much about the history of Assyria and Babylonia, a tale that until the rediscovery of Nineveh had mostly been lost. Thanks to this discovery, we know King Ashurbanipal did not just style himself king of Assyria. He was proclaimed king of the four corners of the world, a title that perhaps reflected his military successes in every direction of the compass. More than that, Ashurbanipal also laid claim to the stars and the planets, for he was not just known as king of the world, but as the king of the universe. The Astrologers of Babylon Grandiose as Ashurbanipal's claims may seem, they did at least make a bit more sense in terms of Babylonian and Assyrian thought. They did not see the stars and planets as separate worlds flung far from Earth. They instead seemed to have viewed them as objects arranged in the firmament for the benefit of humans. As with earlier peoples, they realized the stars were of use in measuring the flow of time. The gods Anu, Enlil, and Enki, their tablets tell us, placed the stars for this reason. Certain bright ones were placed to mark the changing of the months, for example. Marduk, the king of the gods, later arranged them in patterns, with each constellation taking the form of one of the deities. Alongside the stars were the sun and the moon, both gods of their own. The sun regulated the coming of the days, passing through the sky during the daylight hours and judging the dead during the hours of night. The moon representing the god's sin helped mark the flow of time, with each new moon symbolizing the birth of a new month. But as it happens, the new moons are not precisely spread in time. The period from one to the next is about 29 days, yet sometimes it is 30, and occasionally even 31. Neither do the 12 new moons quite add up to the 365 days of the year. For the people of Assyria, the reason for this inconsistency was clear. The moon was a god, and the gods have wills of their own. They believed the variations in the timing of the new moon were omens so that a new moon that came late might be a bad sign, or perhaps a good one if it had tarried in order to arrive alongside Venus. To keep track of these omens and to make them useful in predicting the future, the astrologers of Babylon created a set of tablets we now call the Enuma Anu and Lil. In it, they recorded the timings of the new moons, their appearances, the sightings of lunar and solar eclipses, and the risings of the planets and stars and after they linked them to omens of future events. The Enuma Anu and Lil The Assyrians and Babylonians were old enemies. In the time of Ashurbanipal, that is, the 7th century BC, the Assyrians were dominant, ruling Babylon as a subject city. But as we saw, that did not last. And so too in the past had Babylonia at times been independent or held sway over much of the Assyrian lands. Because of this long shared history, 
the Assyrians and Babylonians had much in common. They spoke the same language, Akkadian and later Old Aramaic. They had similar beliefs and spoke of the same pantheon of gods. It should come as no surprise, then, that the Babylonian tablets of Enuma, Enu, and Lil were found in the ruins of the library of Ashurbanipal. How they got there is unknown, though it is certain the Enuma, Anu, and Lil is ancient, and that it was already around a thousand years old when Ashurbanipal built his library. It is said that Ashurbanipal used threats and war to fill his library. Perhaps, then, the tablets were taken as tribute to Nineveh, or perhaps they were looted from Babylon. Perhaps they were treasured documents even then, regarded as wise and infallible omens from a forgotten past. Whatever their origins, it is the content of the tablets that is most interesting today. Put together, they demonstrate the first basic understanding of astronomy and the first documentation of the periodic patterns in the heavens. One tablet, for example, recorded the movements of Venus over a period of two decades. There is no evidence that the Babylonians ever properly distinguished the planets and stars. After all, both look much the same. But they did notice that Venus acted differently to the other stars. For one thing, Venus was bright and hard to miss. And unlike the stars which hold their place in the sky and rise on the same day each year, Venus moves around. It does not belong to any one constellation, but instead darts between them over the course of several years. In the Babylonian cosmology, this kind of behavior was the clear sign of a god. Venus they named Inanna, the goddess of love. Mars was Nergal, a god of disease and death. Jupiter became Marduk, the king of the gods. And as with the moon, they recorded the movements of the planets and interpreted them as omens. The Omens of Venus Venus is closer to the sun than Earth is. That means two things. First, that the planet always appears close to our star, becoming visible either in the dawn or in the dusk. And second, that the planet moves around the sun faster than the Earth does. This results in a repeating pattern. At times, the planet seems to vanish from the sky. Then, after a period of either days or weeks, she will reappear, either in the morning or in the evening. Afterwards, she will stay there consistently appearing at dawn or dusk for several months before she vanishes once more. Today we know this pattern comes from the relative movements of the Earth and Venus around the Sun. At times the two planets will be on opposite sides of our star, in which case Venus disappears for a few weeks. Later Venus overtakes the Earth, vanishing for a few days as it is drowned out by the glare of the Sun. It happens, however, that there is a ratio between the orbits of the Earth and Venus. For every eight times the Earth circles the Sun, Venus will complete almost exactly 13 orbits. As seen from Earth, then, Venus appears to follow an eight-year-long cycle in the way it switches between being a morning star and an evening star. The years of the Venus tablets cover at least two of these cycles, showing the Babylonians had some idea of the patterns in its motion. But the Babylonians do not seem to have analyzed the pattern in any way we might call scientific. Instead, they regarded it as part of their omens. Like modern astrologers, they believed the future could be foretold in the stars. Our ancient ancestors may have believed the same. Indeed, we have no idea when the Babylonians or their predecessors started to record omens. It is possible, perhaps even likely, that they were continuing traditions started before humans settled down and built cities and civilizations. But what was different was the systematic collection of data. The Babylonians were not yet scientists but they were the first peoples we know of to start writing down the appearances of the planets and stars over long periods of time. True, their aim was to read the celestial signs and to interpret divine messages, but alongside that they began to learn more subtle things about the natural world. In doing so, they laid the foundation for future revolutions. All science begins with the gathering of facts, and that is exactly what the Babylonians began to do three and a half millennia ago.